So welcome everyone. Um, ha, here's our start. We are super excited um, for you all to be here and to listen in on our presentation um, of a really um, exciting and new project that David and me, we have been working on I for two years and David for a much longer period of time. And um, maybe I just quickly introduce us. I am Maria Exner, I'm the founding director of Publix. And what Publix is, we are going to explain in the next 50 minutes. Um, I'm a journalist. I've been with Die Zeit in Germany for 10 years um, and have been running uh, with a team of colleagues the digital newsroom for quite some time. Um, and now I'm the founding director um, of this new building for democracy um, and journalism. And that's David. David. Um, I'm publisher of Corrective. And uh, we are working in different spheres. We do investigative journalism and uh, a lot of media literacy projects in different styles. And we try to innovate journalism, combining it with arts and stuff, with theater plays, so on. So on. And tomorrow at 5 p.m. there's a session where Corrective is going to pre present their latest investigations that have sparked wide spread demonstrations in Germany. So go to their session tomorrow at five. Um, <clears throat> just before um, we will go right into what a lighthouse for journalism could be, um, let me say a few words uh, from which perspective this project is like looking at the future of journalism in the media. And we are looking through it from the lens of um, democracy needs infrastructure. And what is meant by that, that in a democracy, people not only re need roads and uh, schools and um, a voting process to be approached and to be able to move, but they also need professional media to be able to actually realize their fundamental rights of access to information, uh, freedom of expression, um, politi the political process. And the media has had a vital role in this um, in this aspect for many, many years, and as you all know, um, we really face uh, c quite um, numerous problems in like executing our vital role for democracy because of the rise of social media platforms, because of the crumbling business models, and um, because of political forces that use um, social media platforms um, to really, ah, I have to proceed. Um, to really channel fears of people towards um, these aspects. I'm sure you all know these, uh, these pictures um, from all over the world, um, into riots and also into election and voting uh, success. And I think um, what uh, is at the heart of the public's project is the idea that if media and journalism is a vital infrastructure for democracy, then we need critical infrastructure for this field. And this is exactly um, what the building is um, trying to promote. So our little presentation will have these three parts. We are going to talk a little bit about how the idea to have a building for the future of journalism and democracy came about, what, it's actually, what it actually does look like, and what we aim to do with it. And the only person in the room who's been there when the idea came about is David. So, um, what was what was at your at the heart of your thinking when you came about uh, uh, across the idea? Um, when we set up Corrective as a new uh, publishing ven venue venture, uh, as a new company for publishing for, for journalism, we thought of what might be the biggest thing we can think of, and then we thought about a chocolate factory, and. <laughs> A chocolate factory for journalism is something where you can combine a hostel, you know, as a big journalistic project, you will have a lot of guests, visiting journalists, people who you are going to interview, whatever, or you are working with, who come from very far countries, they need a place to stay. To have them in your building is cheaper, so we said, okay, we need a hostel in the house. Then we th uh, thought of a working space, but with a stable rent. So the rent is not increasing all the time, especially in Berlin. So we need something with a place for us to work, but with a stable rent. Then we are going to work with different people, so for different projects with, I don't know, a lot of different guys. 
what would be if all these people would be also in our building, but in co-working spaces? So we don't pay the rent, but they pay the rent. Um, that was basically the, the idea. Um, and then we thought, if we are so many journalists together, we need a lot of coffee and we need food. So we thought of a restaurant. There must be a restaurant in it as well. And uh, what is important for modern journalism is space for events. And we thought of, okay, if you already got a coffee shop and uh, food, then it's in a restaurant, and in a restaurant you can have uh, events. So that was basically the idea, plus a cinema. <laughs> so this is public. <laughs> So one of the things that David didn't mention <laughs> is that um, if we're thinking about uh, media startups, and correct, mm -hmm. he was a media startup mm -hmm. at the time, you pretty quickly came to a point where you think, yeah, we need all of, you know, we need production studios and things, and other people need them too, but we don't have the money to yeah. pay for it. Absolutely. And all this idea, all the chocolate factory was too expensive for us, and we wanted it to have it in Berlin. Um, as our main news desk is in Berlin, and it's very expensive to have it in Berlin. And that was then the time when we met uh, Schöpflin. Philanthropy. Philanthropy, right. So at the time when David thought about the chocolate factory, uh, one of the foundations in Germany who is funding journalism, it's the Schöpflin Foundation, and um, uh, I have to excuse Tim Goebel, the uh, director who co couldn't be here today, um, they had quite some years of experience in funding individual uh, journalistic projects, like both editorial teams and also infrastructure organizations. And they found that the impact that the money that they, you know, kind of poured into the field didn't have, you know, as much effect as possibly an investment into lifting up the whole ecosystem. Like it was nice to give corrective money and other organizations uh, money. But how could, you know, can you as, an, as a philanthropist really try to um, come up with an idea that has an effect on the whole ecosystem of information gathering and journalism? And they also had another problem um, or something that they thought about, which is if you, are, um, if you are a philanthropist and you want to invest money, you also need to think about how to, you know, have a sustainable financial um, model behind your philanthropic activities. It's like, where do you invest in order to be able to then give money to grantees? And um, to build a building and invest in real estate is a possibility um, to do something with your um, endowment or uh, the money that you've earned, which is in line with your mission as a as a philanthropy, as a foundation, and which is maybe not, you know, have the money work at the financial markets, generate profit, and then give it to a certain community. Um, and then a third thing that the uh, foundation was thinking about at the time was how do we really know which are the really interesting new promising projects in a field? because mostly foundations don't really, you know, are not part of a specific ecosystem. They come a little bit from afar, from the distant, and they have to ask around, and they have to have really good kind of, um, you know, possibilities to find interesting new um, funding partnerships. And the building could possibly be a space for them to be quicker and, you know, have a better um, system of, like, trying to find the really promising investments. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add one thing. What is also interesting from our perspective as a project, we invest our rents in our own future. So who do we pay our rents to? To somebody who is like a, 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 an international investment fund who uses the money we pay uh, to, I don't know, build up its own future or fortune and get more billions? Or do we invest it in a project, common project with a foundation, where we then, then afterwards get an effect from? So it's a common good. If you want to sit, there are a few seats here in the front. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, getting all of these things that David mentioned that I was uh, telling you about, the thinking of the Schöpfling Foundation, they came up with that idea, it's a building, so we should actually build a building. 
Um, with all of these, you know, which, which could have all of these functions that I put on the slide, um, a, a place for outreach, a place for education, um, public education, a place for media production, um, a place for um, watching movies, um, and advocacy. And then uh, Corrective came up with these first sketches. Yeah. And then happened what? Yeah, that was uh, a marketing idea. So having such an idea of a chocolate factory is quite easy. But how do you get it into life? First of all, you need to have a picture. And if you don't have it as a real picture, you need to draw it. So this is what we draw. With this um, pictures, we were able to approach the Schöpflin Foundation and talk to them about the broader idea of bringing all these different organizations together. And then it was very fruitful. Um, we wrote a first uh, concept note on that, like eight years ago, something like this. And then we said, okay, we are going to make a call. We wrote it as a concept and then we said, uh, published it in the internet, in the web, and said uh, every German city can uh, apply for our house. They can ask us if we want to build it within their neighborhoods or in their city center. And then over 60 German cities applied to us and said we want to give you the ground. Um, most of the cities said it's even cost-free. Unfortunately, these cities were... <laughs> quite remote. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were not Berlin. <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, we did it um, also to put Berlin under pressure because we uh, already knew where a good spot is for this house. It was in the very city center. And uh, we wanted to say to Berlin, you know, you can have it, but then we need this spot. And it was uh, a spot owned by the uh, city of Berlin and we wanted them to sell us uh, this spot. And then we said, okay, we could also go to Berlin, uh, to Hamburg or to Köln or to Essen, wherever. You know, we've got here these different applications from the cities. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out because in Berlin at that time, there were the leftist party, also in a member of the Senate. And they said, we can have the spot, but only for 40 years. And I don't know whether anybody of you ever built a house uh, investing so much money in a spot of land for 40 years. It's quite crazy. You can build a tent on such a spot, but not a house. And that was very unfruitful discussions leading nowhere. And then the Schöpflin Foundation got fed up and just bought a spot. <laughs> And I will, I will show you where the spot is. Um, it's not in the city center of Berlin. And I think this, like, um, this uh, little down in the story is actually quite an upside because now Publix is being finished in the most multicultural part of Berlin, in Neukölln. And we will have the chance to try out many of the journalistic experiments in contact with a neighborhood that for me represents the actual society um, realities in our country, which is not the case in the city center of Berlin. Um, but in Neukölln, we have uh, people living there with 23 or 26 different nationalities, 20, almost 20 different languages. Um, and it's going to be very, I think it's going to be much more interesting to run publics in this area. Um, and, uh, but David, maybe one question about this process in the 60 cities that applied, is there, is like, what was your, um, what was your idea? Why was it so attractive for them? Uh, it's about the future of industries. And it's, it's very easy to explain to uh, uh, cities that you bring innovative people with innovative products working in software industries also who will be able to um, give a boost to your um, publishing companies around your, your city. And this is very attractive because it's a sign for the future. If you get something like this in your city, your city will be a, an attractive point for all people all around Germany, all around Europe to see what is going on in the next step. And it's, it's a kind of uh, Wirtschaftsförderung. What is Wirtschaftsförderung? Um, economic su support, support, support for economic growth. 
and this is something every city can understand. Everywhere, not only in Germany. I guess it's also possible in Italy and everywhere else. Yeah, we are mainly presenting this here also to inspire <laughs> others. So we think this could work in other countries just as well. So this is what the actual building now looks like. It's almost done. It's going to be finished in May. Um, it's a 5,000 square um, meter building. It has uh, six floors. It has a um, co-working space and open um, ground floor for events. We are going to have the restaurant that David wished for. <laughs> um, we also have production studios for video and audio production that are shared by the more than 30 organizations that are going to use the house. And the organizations are, um, I'm going to show you, they are partly editorial teams um, Collective is going to be the biggest newsrooms, but there are going to be up to 12 other editorial projects also using the space. And then many civil society organizations who are providing the ecosystem in which journalism lives today. Um, <clears throat> just a little food for the eye. So this is, um, this is our ground floor. We will have conference rooms and a forum for up to 200 people, so events for up to 200 people and seated. Um, I already mentioned the studios. There's a co-working space for up to 120 people. And um, on the top floor, there are these ateliers where people can actually stay overnight. Um, so I've been working um, in editorial houses, buildings, for quite some time. And if I think this is a building that every editorial team would wish for because it has everything under one roof. And so for me, it's, it's kind of a model for what an ecosystem-based media building should look like in the future. It's not owned by one company, but it's a shared infrastructure for many, many, many organizations. Um, and this is the network, um, just a few of the organizations that are moving into the house. Um, you see the logo of Correctif. You also see the German chapter of Reporters Without Borders. They are, um, they are coming. Investigate Europe is a cross-border um, journalistic project. Um, there are also Tactical Tech, for example, is an organization that has many years of experience with um, showcasing investigations in the form of exhibitions. Um, I see uh, Christina in the, uh, in the <clears throat> audience who is working on live journalism. So we are really also trying to explore new ways to bring stories to life. Collective ex is experimenting with uh, theater um, uh, productions uh, to bring investigations across. Um, and then there is a, a, another tr you know, kind of red thread that's running through the house. And this is organization who do media literacy programs and also who work on um, uh, societal, gesellschaftlicher um, Zusammenhalt, well, <laughs> how our societies stick together, anti-polarization. Um, and, and David, what do you think, like what, what is your thinking? Um, you will move in on the 2nd of May um, with Correctiv and the whole newsroom, and then, and then what? What I think, or what I do expect from this building and from all these collaboration options that we are going to have is just a boost of creativity. I think and I expect, um, for example, the biggest things I work on um, for myself is like how we can combine art with journalism or theater with journalism. We know it works. It works very well. Our investigation on, on the AFD, we had in the Berlin Ensemble in a theater play, in a theater, and that play was watched um, by, I don't know exactly the figures, but uh, above, well above 500,000 people, a theater play, which is not very common to see online a theater play by so many people. So it works. People are watching this. But have we ever explored as journalists, as investigative journalists, what is really possible. We just do experiments, but we never s search for it. I expect um, the public's building to be such a ground where we can explore these things. Another thing that I expect very much uh, from, from creativity there is uh, combining journalism and fine art to start really thinking and working on 
uh, what can you do with, a, I don't know, with, with such a painting, for example? How can you use it for storytelling? I guess as a journalist, we never thought of ways how to use these elements, or not very often. This is what I expect. There are so many people there, and the coffee bar is so good. And I tried to, <laughs> to give you the idea to buy the right coffee. So I guess over this coffee, downstairs where you have a small park, you know, you will have these discussions. And this is, for me, the biggest thing. Can you say something about one of the images we put on the slide? Mm -hmm. is, a, is a very young crowd of uh, people, and yeah. um, and we are hopefully going to be a hub for the Salon Five project. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is also something what I guess is uh, underestimated. Um, when we do stuff for kids or for younger people, we tend to be teachers to the young youngsters, to the kids. You know, we we. We tend to explain to them what they need to think, what they need to learn, but we don't accept them as the ones who start things doing, moving and learning by doing. And this we do with uh, Salon 5, and Salon 5 is um, a newsroom from kids for kids. Um, we have a, a radio station which is broadcasting their products, And this uh, radio station is, has got now around 150 to 170 uh, kids as reporters who are constantly producing uh, content. And they do it for themselves. We organize the conference, so they've got a news conference, the structure. But they are discussing, not we are discussing. They are producing the stuff, not we are producing the stuff. And this is also very important for the public's building because these youngsters will be there and they will have a real impact on what we are going to do and produce in the public's building. And there's one spot in the public's. If you ever come to Berlin, visit public's building, go downstairs and go for the lab. This is a kind of open space. I guess you are talking about that more. <laughs> I, But I this can. is, I'm so, ah, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so one part of the ground floor is, um, is a modular space that we are calling now the box um, mm. that has a window to the, uh, to the big street that's running in before the building. And it's kind of a window between the two worlds. So people who would just you know, walk by the building can look inside through this window and really see, for example, a Salon 5 editorial conference or a media literacy program happening right behind um, the glass. And, um, and this is really you know, kind of a, an important aspect of, um, of the whole idea to have a media ecosystem also, um, I haven't talked about, um, like encompassed by a pretty well thought through security concept. And at the same time, have an open space that is, um, that is welcoming young people from the neighborhood where we could do you know, these kinds of projects together. And, and I think this is, this is going to be also for us, as uh, me and, and my team, who we are running the building now from May on, is going to be the biggest, one of the biggest challenges and also the biggest you know, kind of things that I'm most interested in is like how do we, or will we really be able to bring the neighborhood um, into contact with, um, with the building and the people working in it? And, um, and project like Salon 5 that Corrective is running now for a couple of years already and you have experience with it will help greatly in like mm -hmm. also breaking down the barriers between a building that is very, as you saw, you know, it's a big, shiny, uh, quite aesthetically quite intense building and a neighborhood that is not used to these kinds of, um, these kind, this kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What I think what is also so interesting about that is something we all need to think of. Um, how many doors you need to cross and open before you are talking to an editor in your news organizations? How many doors a visitor needs to open before he can talk to you? And in this public building, we will want to say it's one door and this door is almost always open. And to have this mind and idea, this will bring change to the whole um, ecosystem and journalism itself. Yeah, and I've, I've already, I'm, I've been touring this um, with this idea uh, a little bit at the, 
um, centers of public broadcasting in Germany, and I'm always saying, um, hey, I'm here at your building, you're at the fringe of the city behind fences that are like three meters high, and there's never anyone from the public you are catering to in the, inside this building. And I really hope that not only from, from Germany, but from all over Europe, people will come and have a look and, and maybe think about how they could also redevelop their own real estate in a way that is much more in line with the mission that we all as journalists have, which is like really being in contact um, with the people in our countries. Um, I can say maybe a few more words um, besides the collaborations that we will try to nurture between the organizations that will uh, work inside the house. We have started to um, build um, you know, a few program um, parts which will develop over the next years. One is a fellowship program. Um, so we offer um, fellowships um, for edu educational reporting now, and we will develop a tech journalism program for hopefully up to 10 people each year. Um, we also started to do reports where we think um, there's not enough also, um, you know, uh, research done on specific aspects um, uh, of the media uh, or the journalism prax practice and the reality in our field. Um, and we are also working on something that is a big topic, I feel, in this year's um, conference, which is um, funding for innovation and, and new um, endeavors in our field, but also for, um, you know, kind of stabilizing existing, um, <clears throat> especially local news. Um, so we hope to uh, get the, not only the house off the ground, but also a funding scheme uh, which will provide um, uh, um, funding for more than just one year, uh, kind of sustainable funding for new um, editorial projects. So uh, hopefully we will be able to talk more about that next next year at this conference. Um, and then um, maybe you know just to push on this <laughs> on this idea, David said the last slide should be a, a map of the world connecting publics with all the other journalism lighthouses around the globe. So why? Yeah. What I think is um, such a building is a statement. It's a statement for democracy. It's like when we see ourselves as the engines of democracy, uh, our product is democracy. And such lighthouses will be the option for people to see and touch democracy, to experience democracy. It's, of course, it's in the, in the uh, parliament that policy is being made. But what about the people? What can they change? Where can they participate? Where can they be really into it, into the story? And this is a building. It's a very old concept. You know, we are here in Perugia because of what? Because the city is beautiful, you know? Not because it's in the city, uh, in the center of the world. Absolutely not. It's far away from the airport. But it's... <laughs> It's beautiful, it's old, you can touch it. And these kind of buildings, we can build all over the place. In the end, it's a business concept. The shared spaces is a business concept. You can convince people all over the world to share this business. People can make money with it. So tell them about that, they can construct it, and then we can connect all these buildings all over the world so we can share these experiences everywhere. I think it's really astonishing simple, you know. Um, this public building is really beautiful and it's very expensive. I guess something like this is not repeatable so easily. But you can make it also a cheap version of it, you know. It's just some place where you can sleep, you need some uh, coffee bars and you need shared spaces. And if it's owned by yourself or by, by uh, somebody you're working with, then Absolutely, you can do it everywhere, I guess. And maybe, um, maybe I'll add a few words on the, uh, that it's an expensive building and it's beautiful. And I think it's, the, it's, it's on purpose. It's not, and it, it has an intention. It has the intention to make the people who work inside the building feel as important as the parliament. And in most you know, European countries, the parliaments have quite representative buildings, um, as do the governments, as do powerful media corporations. 
And, and under the roof of this building, um, the intention of the philanthropist behind the project is really to make the people um, who do the work that you all do make as you know make feel as important, as powerful, um, and as relevant to the society as the people sitting in and working in other buildings that are equally, you know, powerful and are communicating a certain self-esteem to the um, to the outer world. And so it's it's quite in, it's quite intentional. Um, yeah. And one more word, but I think it's also so important to have it, as you said, uh, a, a big building. It's also a statement that we are not going away. We are going nowhere. When the fascist wants to take over, we are not moving. You are moving. <laughs> you will never be able to throw us out of the city. This is also a statement, and it's important. You know, if it's big. Strong, you can't move it. <laughs> Thank you. So we, uh, we try to be quick, and I'm quite proud that we did, because we really want to have a conversation and take questions. So um, I don't do we have... Um, a micro micros? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Chen, and I'm a freelance journalist based in Berlin. So, very excited to see this project coming along, mm. and uh, hope to be part of it. Uh, so, I have two short questions. Uh, the first one is: um, We know that roughly 20% of the German residents in Germany actually have immigration background, but if you look at the newsroom, there's no way that reflect this sort of uh, um, com composition of the population. <coughs> I'm wondering, as a media hub. What do you plan to do to reflect this uh, diversity and also make sure that, for example, freelancer journalists are also included in, in your media project? Um, and another one is, because we're here at an international journalism festival, um, and we hear from other panels that actually German democracy is under attack based on what's going on right now. What is allowed to talk about in German media landscape in general and what kind of debate can be talked about specifically to the Middle East debate. How do you make sure that this kind of topics actually have a place uh, in your media hub? Can you repeat the, because I didn't really hear the, what the last, the second question is like what you, yeah, okay, could you rephrase it? <laughs> sure. Um, for example, if we go to other panels and the one like just finished, um, they're talking about um, the Palestinian journalists under attack and how Palestinian journalists are working. And if you look at what's going on right now in Germany, and I think it's not, it's sort of a, in a way, a consensus that German democracy is actually in a way in danger. So if we talk about journalism and democracy um, and reflect on what's going on right now in German public space, how do you make sure that this kind of topic actually have a place uh, in your media hub, that people, for example, talk about these topics, won't feel that they're actually threatened? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe we can t uh, take another question and then say, say mm. something about it. Yeah. Uh, I also live in Ber Berlin, and I, I was curious. I didn't see a Google Map. I want to know how fast I can get to Neukölln to check this out. Should I come by bicycle, U-Bahn, or S-Bahn? Please come by bicycle. We don't That's have the parking best way. space. That's the best way. Secure bicycle storage. This is number two. Uh, number three is. Um, not really, I'm just kidding. But um, the Kino, you talked about Kino, but you didn't show Kino, Ta the cinema. Uh, I want to show the Mobile Journalism Awards This there. is the one thing that I didn't get into the host. And can I show so, the Mobile Journalism Awards Film Festival there? Unfortunately, there's no cinema. Oh. But this is this one I didn't get. Okay. We have a beautiful uh, room on the, on the fifth floor that has uh, the capacity for you know showing moving projections and mm -hmm. yeah. So it's there, it's not a cinema, but um, thank you for your questions and I think they're both super important questions. Um, the first around diversity, um, the report that I showed um, that we published um, last uh, autumn was specifically on the aspect of um, the lack of diversity in German newsrooms with regard to uh, economic um, situation of, um, of the families where future journalists are coming from. Um, so, so frankly speaking, there are no working class people in German newsrooms, such as um, um, such 
as there's a lack of people with like diverse um, non-German um, family histories. And um, uh, how, I'm, how we are trying to address this in the public's building is to really go directly to organizations who work with this and try to partner with them. Um, and, and also for the co-working space. So every, like everyone who's using the house needs to go through a kind of a little curation process, which gives me and my team also the possibility to go and talk to people, like just ask people to be part of this. And I think it's, the answer is a similar one to recruiting. If you want to recruit a more diverse newsroom, you have to go to people and just ask them to be part of your team uh, because they won't apply. Um, and I think I, I'm, at the moment I'm taking a similar approach to, um, to try to ensure diversity. And for freelancers, we have uh, the possibility to offer a reduced price for people who do freelance journalism to make sure they are able to pay for the co-working desks. Um, and around the question of, I don't know, do you have a stance on the question of the debate um, around you know, pro-Palestinian voices in Germany? And it's, not, it's like it's not both. It's, it's not, not, that, it's not something that we have at, at the heart of our, you know, kind of mm. projects, but I have an opinion on it. No, it's free. Everybody can talk in Germany about what one wants, but it's also a question if one would like to listen. And I guess sometimes people just don't like to listen. And then there is something like these, uh, if you meant this, I don't know. I, ex uh, I think you mean this by this uh, uh, conference that there was. This is something that is not of political or journalistic issues. So I don't know. I guess if in, in the house would be such a discussion, then there would be such a discussion. I don't see there any problems. Um, um, we have a great reference actually in the building next door because our building has a neighboring building, kind of a sister that's oh. sponsored by the same philanthropist and they have a totally different topic. They are, uh, um, they are devoted to um, uh, bio biodiversity and community practices around the world who ensure biodiversity. But they've become a hub for Palestinian artists and pro-Palestinian voices in the cultural sphere because they have independent funding and they can provide space for dialogue. And I think for me that's a big inspiration and I think we should use our independent funding that we also have uh, to provide spaces for dialogue that don't exist otherwise at the moment. Um, and then this was a question around the cinema. Now we always ask, it, please come with a bike because we don't have parking spaces um, or with public transport. Uh, please. And Jonathan, I see also Jonathan there. Thanks. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is that in, a, in one of the early newsletters that you did, you talked about the name, and you very specifically said that it was Publix, not Publix, as it would be pronounced in German, because it took inspiration from an English pub. Is that, can you just talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? <laughs> the, second thing, the second thing is, um, talking of pubs, uh, in Britain there have been a couple of like, failed attempts to set up similar structures, and I know people have tried in lots of different places. This is the first time somebody has seen this project through in such a, with such a sort of a vision of integrity all the way through, and also, in a way, even more integrity given that you didn't get your city centre um, position. Is, is part of your vision for the future not just connecting with other uh, lighthouses, but also to try and stimulate and help them, um, maybe even on a sort of consultancy basis or whatever, to sort of help these be established as a business model. And then last thing is about this, about where you are in Neukölln. When I was last in Berlin, I was staying in Neukölln, and I walked walk past the building, it's magnificent. But it is, there, it is an area that suffers from in, uh, information inequality, as are many other parts of the city. So I'm curious about that dimension, how you see your interaction you know, do you want to have an impact on Berlin physically in terms of how Berlin will change in how it relates to information? Or is it a sort of bigger, more national or variegated picture? What's, what are the sort of your levels of ambition in that way? Uh, thank you, I, I will, uh, before I take Jonathan's question, um, so the thing, uh, thank you for reading my editorial. Um, uh, the pub uh, was just for me, um, I think it hasn't been part of the conversation of the group of people <laughs> who came up with the name. Um, I think the name came up in connection with thinking about the public 
like being a, a, um, and I, because I've lived in London for a year um, and was a very happy pop attendant, um, uh, I thought about this really specific quality of pops to like unite people that usually don't meet otherwhere anymore. And so I thought it's maybe a good way to come up, to bring across that I don't want the public public's building to be a public's building. Um, because this opens, in German, it opens up references to Asterix and Obelix for all the Germans in the room. Um, <laughs> and so it was important to me to make sure people would pronounce it correctly. Um, and then the connection to other, um, to, uh, to other uh, uh, lighthouses, um, I think uh, what starts at the moment is to, um, as I said, I'm going to media outlets who have buildings. I'm also talking to foundations who have buildings. And they're mostly not open in any regard. Some of them have really tough security standards. Um, and I think uh, the first step towards inspiring others um, to do similar things is to try to invite them to, to see the building and maybe try to inspire them to change something with the realist that they, that they already have. Um, and, and also, hopefully, to inspire funders in other world regions and, and also in other capitals in, in Europe to, to maybe think this is a good way to invest their own money. Um, and then Neukölln and inequality. Um, I've lived in Neukölln for a couple of uh, years uh, and then in Kreuzberg, which is nearby, for more years. And I'm acutely aware of, you know, that we could be seen as a gentrifier. This, air, this region where the, the building is uh, situated is, uh, there are hardly any other, if there are none, no other office buildings there. So it's, it's, a, it's a solely um, an area where people just live. And what we are trying to do with our resources that we have at the moment is, is to connect with civil society organizations in the, in the, in the re region. And we already f found some or are in contact with some who actually want to use this box room that David mentioned before, um, and we can give it to them for free for their own purposes. So this is the first step towards you know, trying to give something that the civil society infrastructure in Berlin can use for their own purposes. And, and yeah, and this will be part of the first year to, you know, just to try to be open and, and try to help in ways we can. What I would like to add is from the perspective of Corrective as a news organization there, I think uh, it's also important to have something like this um, Salon 5 youth project there that you connect with kids. You know, When you work with kids, it's easier to connect with their parents. They are listening to what their kids are producing. And that way we can integrate with the issues that the families have that is there on the street and I guess this is a very important step, but it's extremely difficult. It's not something you can get like for, off the ground, but this is important. Did that answer your question? Jonathan had a question and then there was another question, I think, over there. Thank you. Um, thanks, Maria. Thanks, David. It's, it's really inspiring, the, the new building. Great to hear about it. And I think we'd love to see these lighthouses all around the world. In the, in the UK, I feel, because the media industry in the UK is so concentrated in London, along with all other economic and political power in the UK. And our local news industry is so fragile at the moment. To me, it would make a lot more sense if we were to have a Publix in the UK to actually have 50 or 100 or 200, and they'd be very small and they'd be scattered around. But I wonder, do you see strengths and weaknesses? So obviously, there's the one big, shiny flagship model, or there could be lots and lots of very small public newsrooms on high streets all around the country. It wouldn't have everything, the small thing, it wouldn't have the cinema. Yeah. There's a big difference between Germany and the UK. In Germany, you don't have a centralized structure. So Berlin is province. Berlin in Germany is like in the UK, Bristol. You know, it's, it's not really the center of the world in Germany. It's a beautiful city, but um, have it as a center of something is mostly in the views of foreigners and of people who live in Berlin. <laughs> I don't live in Berlin. I live in uh, Bottrop, which is the real center of Germany. <laughs> I just take all the aggression, the anti-Berlin aggression. <laughs> no, but, but to be honest, um, I think uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a country like the UK, where it is really centralized in, in London, 
uh, you should really do it in Bristol. You know, in a city where you have uh, uh, a news organization, an independent small one, where you've got the option to create something new, and the city is also beautiful, at least in the city center. And uh, yeah, I advocate for Bristol. Um, but I, but I, I absolutely would underline the potential to have a hundred publics in every country. And I think, like when I'm moving around with a train in, in Germany, and I end up in small towns with like in city centers that that don't, um, yeah, that fall apart basically. There's always this one building that has an old sign saying some, some, some newspaper, where there used to be a local newspaper. And if, you know, if I'd had funds and funds, I would, you know, these would be the buildings to have these small little publics. Do you want to? Okay. Okay. So yeah, maybe we last. can have those two and then I think we have to finish off. Yeah? Here, please, in this third. <clears throat> the project is really, really brilliant, but I don't um, imagine this project to be launched uh, in my country, in Azerbaijan. And I imagine that if such kind of project is launched there, they will definitely explode it, <laughs> just to kill the journalists. <laughs> and uh, my question is that um, uh, in any project, the resolvers the risks are calculated. What kind of risks could your project face? Okay, could you repeat the last part? The uh, the what kind of risks your project could just um, face in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say something about that, and then. My question was Ah, okay. Do you also want to say something about it? Uh, one thing is, of course, the risk is that it's a central point for attacks, so you know where you need to attack for bombings, for example. You know, it's a target. Um, in a country like Germany, I don't expect bombs to explode in front of our building. In other countries, this might be a problem. Um, then there is a risk, um, a financial risk, um, that we as the, uh, as the people who uh, have there our workspace, that we are not able to pay our rents. This is a risk. Um, but I'm, to be honest, I think uh, these risks are not really existing. Because when you've got something like this building, you've got something to defend. And if you've got something to defend, people come to help to defend when you've got something. And this is, again, a lighthouse. And when we started to think about our uh, community project as corrective, um, we started to think of it, the people who support us, as our wall against everything. If you've got en not enough um, people who support you, you can be defended against anything. And this is also the idea of this lighthouse, that it's uh, not only a shining point where people say, ah, this is interesting to me, I go there, but it's also a place they can say, this is what I want to defend. And defend means in terms of money, they give you money so we can pay our rents, and uh, also physically. And there was, and, I, and I, I totally agree with what you said initially about a project like this could probably not be realized in this way in, no. in countries where there's just no press freedom. And, and at the same time, I think, so there was a very, very rigorous security uh, process while constructing the building and while thinking about. And so we have in place, I think, a very, very good and well thought through security concept. And, I th and I'm glad that it's there, even though I agree with David that we hopefully won't need it. Um, for, for the next 10 years. Um, but would I li like to be part in thinking about, so, you know, how could something like this be realized in countries where uh, people who do our work need much more protection than in Germany? Yes, and I think that that's a potential, you know, maybe for the upcoming years. Okay, thank you so much for listening and your attention. Yeah.